shallow bevels are really nice because you can create a really <coughs> fine edge and for pairing like end grain of soft wood, it's really functional. Um, because that bevel is very shallow, if you think about it, that where it comes to a point, there's not a lot of meat directly behind the edge. So that edge is not very long lived. If you put a sharper or a steeper bevel on a thing, that edge is going to be longer lived. Um, but there's a whole bunch of information on all those pieces of paper over there around bevels and like miscellaneous woods to use them on, etc. Um, so that's just a quick rundown. The what I normally put onto my blades is a like 25 or 27 degrees is really great, like all around. I'm starting to get into really hard wood like oak and stuff and I'll start putting 30 degree bevels on stuff and like 35 degree bevels but eventually what you're going to have is like two bevels the way I sharpen so I'll put a hollow grind in and that's this bevel right here this like round bevel and then that this is going to be honed you're using a round <coughs> wheel it's actually not putting a flat surface in um, slightly concave the nice thing about that is that if you're not using a jig to sharpen with because you only have two points of contact on the front and the back of the blade you can put a hollow grind in and then get really good registration So the smaller the diameter of the blade of the wheel that you're putting a hollow grind in, the deeper the hollow grind and the length the more enhanced path. So you're gonna have to work that blade to put the uh, um, So in general, would you do you recommend a larger wheel for the hollow grind then? Or it's just kind of what you feel like I use doing? Uh, See, when I get to the point where my edge that I'm honing, and you can pass these around, gets to about that point, like a third of the way up my primary bevel, um, <clears throat> that's the point at which I'll put a fresh hollow grind in. No. And when I put a fresh hollow grind in, I'm not going to grind all the way to the very edge of the blade. Because right now, the edge of that blade is honed to like so it makes no sense to grind it down to 220 and like remove that very nicely honed edge. So I'll put a hollow grind in to reestablish it, but I'll leave a thin sliver of like fine stainless steel. Um, okay. I'll show you as soon as one of those comes back around. So So if we're doing the hollow grinds, I'll use this grinder a lot of the time. And when I'm holding my chisel, I'm holding it with my index finger kind of perpendicular to the blade and my thumb on the back of the blade. I'm not putting a lot of pressure on this blade to the wheel, right? And I'm constantly pointing it in water to keep it cool so I'm not burning off the edge. And you can put a hollow grind into something pretty quickly that way. Um, and as I'm in order to like bring the blade up on the rest, I'll register the top of my index finger on it and almost like put pressure on my thumb to slide the blade up my index finger. <laughs>
Tell what you've kind of like taken off and removed by the. I mean, really, it's at a different angle, so the light's going to refract off of it. So when you're seeing like little mirror resurfaces, like if you look in the back of your edge on blade, sometimes you'll yeah. see like a little bit of a mirror right along the very edge, and that means that that edge has been folded over, and it's like dull now hmm. when you're seeing that because you're seeing the light refracted in a different way. Will it be um, folded like this? Yeah, it's or just yeah. kind of like crumpled yeah. some. But, but yeah. crumpled up this way, not crumpled this way. It could be either, either way. way. On hand planes, a lot of the times yeah. you'll see it because it's people drag the hand planes back across the right. wood so it folds the edge up. Yeah. But depends on how you're using it. So I've taken a little bit more than I wanted to off of this corner. But the you, other thing to... You get really close to the edge. Now. Yeah, because you want to put a hollow grind in it that you can leave in there. The other thing to check when you're done is just that that blade is actually at 90 degrees. So I'll throw them on a protractor and like hold that up to the light and check to see that that's pretty dang close and it's off of the grinder. That's really friggin' close. It's a little bit um, a little bit higher here and a little low here, but I use these metal protractors are really nice for this stuff. They're also really nice for figuring out 
you know, if you're setting the gr setting a grinder fresh, you can use that to figure out like what angle you have your blade ground to. So right now this one's ground to 24 degrees, but you'll get that really positive registry and be able to see that very clearly. What's that thing called? The protractor. <coughs> so. It's a pretty fancy protractor. They don't usually have this. Uh, these ones are pretty common. You can yep. get them in like Home Depot, Lowe's, oh. etc. Um, did, did you do anything to set the angle on the grinder before you started? I did. I, I, because I know that I always grind my blades to a little bit less than 24, I just stuck it on there and stuck the blade on the wheel and made sure that it was where I wanted it to be. Does that sound? Well, if we need to adjust the angle. Knobs on it, you can just loosen them and tighten them. Knobs on that little... Knobs on the tool rest. How do you actually set the angle? Oh, I, because these are my chisels, I know that I had previously hollow ground it to less than 25 degrees, like 24, 23 degrees. So I actually used the angle on the chisel itself to set the angle on the tool rest, knowing that the old primary bevel on here was like 24 degrees. And assuming you picked up a chisel that wasn't yours and it was at like 30, you would just visually look and be like, okay, I'm taking off some, or? If I was to do that, then I would, yeah, start it visually, and then maybe even do like grind enough just so that you have just a little bit of a facet, mm -hmm. um, and then put a protractor on it and check that facet and see. But you can get it pretty close off the just following the angle that's already there after you've measured it and making slight adjustments. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. If yeah, you want to be super persnickety about it, you can take your bevel gauge and scribe a line on your on a piece of wood <coughs> and cut that at the angle that you want it to be and then line up your tool rest, register your tool rest against the wheel that way. That yeah. Makes sense. There's yeah. I mean, it makes total sense that once you get comfortable with it, it's like, oh, this is not a thing. But yeah. yeah. If you're starting with an unknown chisel, it's nice to know what you would do. Uh, what you do. Yeah, yeah. You can also just like check the angle that's already on the chisel. Yeah, like, that's, oh, that's like thirty odd or whatever. Um, where does that bevel? Where does that protractor live? This lives in my toolbox. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we might have, have we one in the, in the measuring. I have one if someone needs to borrow one. Yeah. Um, I. Water stones are a little bit different from diamond stones in that they do get worn away as you use them. So part of the reason why they cut so efficiently is that the ceramic surface actually starts to get worn away. It creates this slurry with the water and that's like really fast cutting. Um, diamond stones, it's actually just the micron grid of the diamond. So, um, water stones will be um, really good in the speed of cutting. They can, if they're not trued, um, like start to really start to deform your blades, like make it so that, you know, the stone itself will get hollow, so your blade will have this like belly on it almost, so you don't have flat. stone, which is great for truing stones, um, and prior to that we would use a piece of marble with sandpaper on it, but What are those new stones made of, beside the diamond one? I think, Ryan, you could speak to that a lot better than I, I could. I call them ceramic water stones. Okay. So I don't know beyond that. Um, so... To true a stone, all you do is you take a pencil, throw some hash marks down it, and run it on the lapping stone. Until the pencil marks are gone, 
So you can see they're still in the center, so there's still a little bit of hollow there. Um, so now because this is really not that hill to begin with, I'm going to start it on a 1000 grit because in my mind I don't go down any lower in grits than I have to in order to bring something up to right. flat and true and sharp and all that stuff. Um, the, you can sharpen an edge with a really low grit. Um, the edge that you're going to be left with is going to be like, like if you were to take a microscope and look at the steel, it'd be this like very frayed burr. So the higher the grit that you're going to, the finer all those scratches and cut marks are, and the longer that edge is going to last for, because all that's, it's not these like frayed little particulates of sharp steel. It's a very nice, much more uniform sharp edge. Uh, what are what's the grid of those new ones? Uh, on these that ones are three twenty one thousand, five thousand, eight thousand. Yep. Um, I'm using the old ones because I didn't pre soak these, so this is a one thousand. Great. Um, so I'll start by lapping the back of my blade, and then because this is pretty square, I can show you both like free handing it without a jig and using a jig. Um, so I'll. Start by working the back of the blade. I do this a lot on plane blades because of the human tendency to just like drag a plane backwards and that how that kind of folds the edge back. Um, so I'll work the back of the blade with water stones. One of the nice things with water stones is that those scratch marks that you're going to get with lower grits it's this like darker gray color and you'll get this like uniform uh, working of the metal and it'll be this uniform color as you're working as you're getting into higher and higher grits that'll come closer and closer to a polish um, so you can kind of know what part of the blades you're working because of that color change in the scratch pattern so you'll do that um, back polish on like every time you go up in the grid of stone okay okay yeah, yeah. Because I mean, really, what you're trying to do is make that edge of that chisel nice and sharp. And if this side is just scratched up to 320 or whatever, and this side's polished to a thousand, then you know you still haven't done anything about the scratches down here. So we're good. Um, with the jigs, we have two different types of jigs. Um, this is a Veritas jig. This is pretty sweet. And then we have a really simple jig. This guy, there's um, three different major settings on this, and they're labeled here as high angles, standard angles, and back bevels. You don't, should never have to change those. We leave it on standard angles all the time. Um, this has got this sweet little dovetail on it, and you can slide this onto the dovetail. There's a little veneer scale to tell you how wide your chisel is, so this one this is a three quarter inch chisel. So I'll set this on three quarters of an inch. And then there's this little knob. And this adjusts the projection of the chisel out of the bottom of this jig, which dictates the angle. Um, so what you can do is you'll slide your chisel into the bottom. You'll press it up against the side and that keeps it straight. And then this is the stop essentially. So that tells you how what the bevel is going to be. This one's set at 25. Um, so then you can just tighten it down. And then sometimes this knob gets hooked up and hard. So many. Those are a pair of pliers. Right here. 
Yeah, it's actually in the fire drawer. Oh no, so I'm gonna back. <laughs> it's going to rest on the stone and it's the, the length of its projection dictates the, the, the way it's the hypotenuse of that triangle. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, Do you always use that, Daniel? No. I didn't think so. Um, this is really great for like, if I'm like mass manufacturing sharpening, like going through all the tools and throwing a fresh mm -hmm. on them. Um, and then it also has this nice really wide roller. So this registers really well and um, keeps you really dang close to 90 on your edge. Um, it allows less manipulation of the blade in like, you know, say like a three inch wide joiner plane blade that you want to put a little bit of curvature in. You can't really do that. Um, but that's how this jig works. And then it literally just, I don't ever push the blade into the stone, especially on water stones. You can get away with it on diamond stones, but on a water stone, you'll actually cut the stone. <laughs> now my roller's not working. Hmm. That ain't right. Fix this last. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Well, the roller's not working on that. I'm not going to use it. But it's just a drawing backwards. Fix that. Um, as far as the hollow grind goes, and the registration that you can get from the hollow grind. Um, if you, if, I don't know, so you would like to feel that, and like you can feel that registration now with that hollow grind versus the other chisel. Can you feel it when you hit that edge? my own blades because I have the muscle memory for it um, I'll take the take the chisel and I'm holding it like this with my index finger on here and my thumb and middle and ring finger on the blade itself and what I'll do is I'll feel it till I get that registration I'll like rock it a little bit once you get the registration and then I tighten my my thumb middle and ring finger and that tensioning process draws the blade up a little bit so as I'm working here, it kind of like sucks it up and it increases my bevel by like a degree and a half. So I can still maintain my micro bevel and not huh. back off. Just, so it's um, just uh, a weird like body memory thing that I've gotten really used to. Um, so that's a, a degree and a half from the one that you put on here to the one you're putting on there. Yeah, great. For my body. Yep, yeah, right, no, 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 right, right. Um, but then when you're <laughs> sharpening like that, one of the important things is not just to like be running your blade from your elbow because when you think about the body dynamics of that if you're just swinging your arm like this right. your arm's making an arc so that motion should be coming from like shoulder elbow and wrist and and hips or if you don't have like this down and you can't keep this straight then bring it up from the balls of your feet and just use your whole body and keep your arms fairly stationary this is a really good way to like start doing it Sense yes, people. absolutely. So, um, one question about pushing, I understand not to push it, but um, I also did the figure eight sometime. And it, That's a Kevin and me difference. We'll talk about this, Kevin. Yeah, <laughs> yeah great. Um, good. Well, yeah. Good. So, that's, you can <laughs> register that. Do you have to worry about there being too much water on the stone? Okay. No. And if you want, you can keeping your arms stationary and letting it kind of come from the balls of your feet. And then, you know, you can see because I registered that 
and then tension my muscles a little bit. You can see I'm creating an edge that's very similar to the other edges in favor of the edge that was there. On this now, you can also see, let me pass that around, um, you can see the burr that started to form. Um, and so what I'll do on the next stone is, again, polish the back side, and then start to draw that back again. And you're basically just like working that edge and reducing that burr and making finer and finer and finer and finer scratches. So you feel like you're done when you have the burr when you move to the next stone each time? Um, pretty much. But you're not always going to see the burr, especially when you get up to really fine stones. So it's more just like that knowledge of like what the finish on the steel should look like. Does that make sense? Yep. It should look like that. <laughs> it looks really nice. Um, I like the difference between cleaning and then polishing. Kind of at the honing stage here. Mm -hmm. and that's where you're looking for the burr. And then once you're polishing, you're just getting rid of scratches, which is more about the longevity. Every scratch is a point where the blade's going to want fracture. So we polish to get all those out. Do you go all the way up to 8,000 every time? Sorry. Uh, no. Um, that also becomes one of those like honing and polishing things where once you're I feel like really once you're above like 4,000 you're getting into like polishing oh, okay. land um, so quite frequently if I'm just like working with an edge and just like doing a lot of stuff and it's not super specific like I'm not creating like I need to make perfect dovetail joinery right now sort of thing you just got totally skipped into my god yeah. Um, then, then I don't worry about it as much. Um, I'll give them a quick polish on the format, but then it's like, I just go on from there. On the what? On the Tormek, this crazy machine. Um, well, you mean you're polishing on the straw? Leather. Yeah. It has yeah. a, it leather, has a leather, straw. Leather. bring stuff up to like, if I'm just working in back and forth, and it's just general purpose chisel use, I'll do like 1,000, 2,000, 4,000, give them a quick strop, and then go on from there, and just go back to work. Um, so. And does that, do you, are you paying more attention to that when you know that you're going to be doing end grain stuff, or? End grain stuff, or really fine detail, or like, Oh my God, this is like super squirrely. I got grain going in 37 different directions, sort of deal. Then yeah, I'll spend a lot more time on the blade and bring it up to a really good point. Does that make sense to everybody? Um, I can give you a quick one. On the strop here, because this is not a flat strop, you use like a strop on a piece of hardwood. You don't really have to worry about it. You, draw, you know, you're always drawing the blade towards yourself so that you're not belaying the leather. Um, but a strop on a wheel like this, something that I've noticed is you're, if you're running the backside of your blade on this strop, it's basically putting <clears throat> like belly in the backside of your blade. So when you run it, um, Kevin will show you how to use this. And, a week. <laughs> um, when you're polishing your blades, if you're just putting the edge of your chisel against here, right, you're going to be putting this like sculpting this shape in the in the very edge. It's not going to be super extreme because this is a really fine grit, but that's what you're doing. Um, so essentially, you're like making a single bevel blade a double bevel blade. Um, so I try hard not to run the backs of my chisels for any length of time on this straw. And if I do, I like roll into it. So you can see, I mean, you saw the burr that was on here. 
So I'll take this and I'll start my chisel like closer to here. And then I just kind of roll into it and you'll hear the tone of the straw change and that's the point at which the edge is making contact with the straw. Hear that tone yeah. change? So I'll bring it up to the point where that tone changes and just run it a couple times and that folds the burr over. And then the same thing on this side. Hear the tone change. It doesn't take very much. And you can, like, I've just folded the burr over the, to this side. You can see it. And then you can run it over. Side of a chisel. Oh. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> I like put a nice 90 on it and then it was just like <laughs> and scraped it. Um, but now, even after stropping it, like I was saying, that, that the mirror edges are the, that you're seeing, where you're seeing the different refractions of light, you can see there's now a, like a little bit of a bellow going the wrong way almost because you're seeing yep. light reflected, yep. reflected in a different way. That's um, because you use the round stuff? Because I just yeah, went right yeah. like that. But it's such a fine grit, it makes a really nice edge. Yep. So it's you're not all... concerned about that like. Well, I did it very little. I wasn't like yeah. on there forever. Um, In putting the chunk on down, you just put a little dab. I put a I've little, never done that. I put a little dab on my, on, on right on the mm -hmm. strop, and then I use a blade to just spread it around. Yes. Yep. How often do you do that? The compound. <laughs> Whenever it gets stuffy and you clean it off. Yeah, when it starts getting like really gunked up with metal. When it starts getting really shiny. Okay. You know, throw a little compound on there. Flatten it out a little. Can you explain what stuffing is? Uh... It's a gush. Yeah, <laughs> stuffing is like bringing an edge that you can only get so fine because of the grit of a stone up to a very high polish. So like, um, like leather sharpens edges, you know, it's basically polishing that edge and reducing those scratches because it's really, really fine. What we're putting, the compound that we're talking about is like a 2000 grit or sorry, a 20,000 grit compound that you're actually putting on the leather. And uh, so it's like just this really, really, really fine grit. It's just polishing. Um, so it's taking a pretty sharp edge and making it really sharp. And like, and making it really strong and sharp. You put the old fashioned, <clears throat> when that, the guys who cut hair, they drop their razors and they do that, just the, that final polish. You've seen that in the movies where they go like that, huh? They have a leather down here and go like that. Yeah. If you look at like the edge of a blade in an electron microscope, it just looks super ragged. Right. And the finer you get it, the straighter it is, and the more monolithic it is, the more strong it is. It's interesting that leather does that to steel. Well, the steel is really soft when it's, you know, it's micron thick. Yeah, yeah. Does that answer your question, Joe? Yeah, please. I just want to say, uh, a beginner sharpener, the hollow grind is your best friend. Every time you bring the blade to the stone, it should be really obvious where that registration point is. And as soon as you lose that, you want to go back to the hollow grind. Because that's pretty much like having a sharpening jig on the blade. As long as you can feel that point, mm -hmm. it makes the whole process easier. Because once you lose that, that bevel starts to round over. And then it's just like you have no idea where you are. And it's really, really hard to get that edge. Um, 
also want to say with chisels, new chisels or chisels that you don't haven't used before, it's really important to take the time to properly flatten the back to sandpaper going through the grit. Mm -hmm. I think uh, we should probably. Yeah, a lot of them have. Because what's originally left on the, like when you get a brand new chisel, what's on the back of a chisel is basically just the machining. So it's like a rotor, a, a fly cutter on a bridge port or something. So it's basically just it's something that's like cut the steel to remove it. It's not sharpened. It's like the scratches, though they may seem really small, are really quite deep. And so you're like, you're working with a machine surface, not something that's been like flattened and like worked through the grits to reduce it. Is that extrapolating on yeah, that like, statement better? So how would you take like a piece of glass or that granite behind you, mm -hmm. marble, whatever it is? Um, what would you start with? Um, I used to start stuff with 320. Um, because I feel like going below 320, it takes so long to get scratches out. And they don't have any It doesn't also, count though. It's also yeah. line yields. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they aren't flat. They aren't flat. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 See it really clearly. I wish I had a couple of. I'm gonna stand it behind you actually. See if I can find it in like a little crappy stand or something. Could you go up to a thousand? There you go. Down the back. You can go to the large one. The back of this chisel is actually a great example because you can see there are these like very gradual arc cuts. Right. And that, that's a fly cutter on a bridge port. So that's still like, this is still a machine surface. You don't need to have the whole back flattened, do you? You don't need to have the whole back flattened. I mean, you can see that up yeah. here it's yeah. mirrored and clean. But um, sure. if you don't know what is flattened on it or like... So, so would you put that sandpaper on there, on the marble? Um, I run plate black 90% of the time. So this guy's got, got pretty schmutzed up. Um, but I would get some ammonia and a straight razor and I would clean off the plate glass and I would throw a strip of 320 down it and then if we have it, a strip of 400 or something and and I would just mm -hmm. work the snot out of it. And I do it to like my hand plane soles as well. Like when I first get a hand plane, um, I, don't bring, I don't bring hand planes up to like some crazy good or anything, but just to true them and flatten them. And I do that with the blade in and the cap under tension. Because that changes a hand plane, that pressure. Are you saying it's it's deflecting the metal ever so slightly so that yep. you end up with like a rounded or? Mm -hmm. okay. But with um, the blade in but not touching? Yeah. yeah, I don't project the blade out at all. And why do you have the blade in again? Because it's... Because it's, it's putting different. pressure on the hand plane in the way that it's going to be yeah, when you're using it. Yeah. Good. Um, but yeah, plate glass or marble, um, really coarse diamond stones. Um, but I actually have a lapping plate, like a steel, a milled steel plate that's been checked for true and blah, blah, blah um, on my bench that is just the right size to throw sandpaper on and that's what I used to like true up the backs of the first stuff. Um, or really old and super shitty stuff. There's also a good trick for that. Um, the main thing, yeah, you just want to see a polish across the, the edge on the back. Um, if you're scratching it up with a really coarse stone or paper or whatever, you can take the blade to like your 4,000 stone sort of a really polished stone and just do some swipes on there. And that will sort of clear up the picture 
and you'll see where the course paper where isn't the, hitting. Yep. And then, yeah, that's really helpful to see where you're at. Also, you can mark it with like you did on the stone for the pencil or sharpie. Yeah, exactly. Or the plane that you're taking. Yeah, any place. Yeah. Did you uh, throw the back of the plane right on the lapping plate, or is that too much for the for that material? This lapping plate is specifically designed only for true water sports. So, provided you don't mean that, and you're talking about plate glass or diamond stone, yes, I would do that. What's for the lapping plate? This is for lapping diamond stones. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, um, what grit is that diamond lying on? This one? Yeah. That's, I'm not sure what the micron is on that, but I know that the grit structure is totally different. Okay. To cut specifically water stones at a very high rate and not get clogged.